Yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Paul Lashmar. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm at City University of London. Um, uh, I suggested this panel because uh, I've been reported on. I've been a reporter covering national security. Plus, I have engaged. I've, I've recently written a book about the relationship between uh, intelligence and the media. And I'm. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, comes up, and I'll talk a little bit more of, is uh, quite concerned about the way that national security is being reported uh, in the UK and um, elsewhere. Uh, I, I, my view is that uh, it's one of the most difficult beats in journalism, and accurate reporting of this uh, growing sector is, by its very nature, very hard to do. And um, and I think it's become so much more significant. Yet more and more, I see uh, reporters who d who are uh, not really getting to the bottom of issues. There's a lack of digging. Um, reporters in, uh, encounter particular political, ethical, legal, and journalistic issues in covering, uh, investigating national security issues. Um, what I've done to, uh, is we've as assembled a panel here because one of the key issues we're thinking about is how do you teach um, early career journalists or students how to engage with the national security entities? Um, one of the things I've written in my research about is the growth of the intelligence lobby. Um, from once upon a time, they, certainly in the UK, operated uh, supposedly in silence. Well, they didn't operate in silence. They operated through uh, vectors, if you like. But nonetheless, they were not easily available to journalists or the public. These days, they've become much, much more sophisticated. They have a very effective lobby, of, uh, often of either former uh, senior officers from the intelligence services or from... Um, uh, or from regulators. The growth of regulators has brought in a whole new breed of people who are prepared to comment. Gosh, am I not loud enough already? <laughs> <laughs> I was, anyway, sorry, uh, I'll come straight. So, um, during the course of the, this session, um, I'm going to introduce my, uh, the, the, the panel, and um, we each, each brings a different dimension to this question. Gosh, I'm finding it loud. So, um, I'll just, um, so first I have Professor Vian Bakir, who is Professor of I in Political Communication and Journalism at Bangor University, and uh, researches journalism and political communication across three areas. Uh, she's going to talk about her, uh, a number of things, including her recent book, Intelligence Elites and Public Accountability, uh, Relationships of Influence with Civil so Society. T to my far right, I've got Alexandra Freimischler, if I pronounce that right, uh, is an associate researcher at the Harry S. Truman Institute for the Advancement of Peace. She also lectures at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her research focuses on journalism practices and political communications. Um, and then thirdly, I have with me Josh Meyer. Josh is a, a long-standing investigative reporter, has worked for the LA Times and many other organizations. He was on the staff of Politico from 2016 to 18. Um, what's, uh, I think, particularly significant here, he has, um, uh, he has actually taught a course at Medhill in the States, uh, the Medhill uh, Journalism School at Northwestern University, uh, dealing specifically with teaching uh, students, student journalists, how to deal with national security. There are very few places that do this. Um, City University, we have a, a elective, so that's a, 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 a semester-only module which has, um, uh, in which the students look at both crime and also um, at national security. But it's virtually untaught elsewhere for journalists. So, and I think this becomes partly because it seemed to be something you do with a lot of experience. But the point I was making earlier was very much that it is now lots of journalists now cover national security, and as a result, they need some introduction as to how to deal with it, how to deal with this very powerful secretive uh, set of entities within the state, uh, and have, you know, so that they can develop skills to enable themselves to cope with knowing what's uh, true and not true. And you'll notice the title of this 
panel uh, refers to the Wilderness of Mirrors, which is attri attributed to the famous CIA opposite James Ju uh, uh, Ju Jesus Angleton, and I think is one of the great uh, metaphors for, for the nature of uh, the way that uh, intelligence agencies work and how you think they're doing one thing, but they're doing something entirely different. And also, uh, that it's all, it all gets confounded in sort of James Bond mythology, and uh, journalists can get very overexcited about uh, working with the intelligence agencies, and you need to build in a factor that it's actually what the ramifications of these, um, these extra legal activities they engage in are. So I would like to first ask Vianne to uh, speak, and we'll work through the panel. Okay with this microphone? No, 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 no double mics. <laughs> so, as Paul said, it is a difficult area to teach, um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more about that um, from the journalists. I'm not a journalist, I never have been. I'm an academic. Um, so what I want to talk about really, just very briefly, is actually the academic side of this um, equation. I think it's one of the reasons it's difficult to teach is there's not much academic research actually on the area. So last year, I brought out a book that uh, does a systematic review of um, all the major works, basically, published in academia on relationships of influence between, on the one hand, intelligence elites, and on the other hand, civil society, which includes journalists, um, but also non-governmental organizations, whistleblowers, the general public. Um, the book is called, if anyone is interested, Intelligence Elites and public accountability, uh, relationships of influence with civil society. So this term intelligence elites is something which I coined. Um, it's something a bit wider than the intelligence agencies themselves. I mean, intelligence agencies, they, they will tell you, they are public servants and they work to maintain the national interest and national security. And they are subject to you know, all sorts of layers of oversight internal oversight from, you know, legislatures, from judiciaries, this sort of stuff. This oversight is imperfect, but it exists. Intelligence elites, on the other hand, um, highlights the intelligence agencies' very close ties to far less accountable entities um, in the political world, the corporate world, and the military world. And the intelligence elites will develop secretive policies with far-reaching impact on all citizens. So, I mean, we only have to, we don't have to scratch the surface very far to see some of these policies over the last couple of decades, secretive policies developed by intelligence elites that, you know, contravene human rights, that contravene civil rights, democratic rights, and going on in long established liberal democracies. I mean, the universal torture ban, as we all know, was contravened by the CIA's detention and interrogation program. The right to privacy was contravened by the National uh, Security Agency's digital mass surveillance programs. So these are American programs. But of course, uh, the complicity or the cooperation of scores of other countries in these arrangements is also known now. Um, and uh, you know, more recently, we have the rise of secretive influence campaigns conducted during elections, again, in long established liberal democracies. We've just come from a panel on dark money in Brexit. So, you know, this, this, this festival is looking at these things. Now, the point is um, that, I that I want to make is formal oversight of intelligence agencies and, um, well, intelligence agencies fail to prevent these policies. These policies have existed, you know, for a long time. Um, there could be all sorts of reasons for this failure of oversight. I'm not going to go into them. Um, there's all sorts. Of, there's, there's a literature on why oversight fails on intelligence agencies. It's things like co-optation of the politicians, deference of the politicians, uh, lack of understanding of the issues. Of course, the secrecy that these issues are surrounded by. So I won't go into those. Are in the book if you're interested. But my point is, you know, these these are. These are long-standing contraventions of human rights and civil rights that the examples I've just cited. So oversight mechanisms have failed to keep the intelligence agencies in check, partly because um, it's not just intelligence agencies running these programs, it's intelligence elites, and these are far less accountable. So how, how can they be held to account? And obviously, you know, journalism could play a really key role here if it functioned a bit better. Um, as Paul says, very few universities teach students how to go about 
um, doing this sort of work, national security reporting. Even fewer teach about intelligence agencies. I don't think anyone teaches on intelligence elites unless I'm wrong. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, anything could be taught here. Um, but th there is a bit of research out there uh, up to understand the patterns of news coverage or learning what the obstacles are. And of course, if you know the obstacles systematically, you can have strategies to overcome them. But there's hardly any academic research in the area. Um, I mean, my systematic review went back to all the major works across four disciplines, history, international relations, media journalism, to see what was ever been written on this. And there was so little on the relationships of influence, basically, um, between intelligence elites and civil society. And this lack of research seems to stem from things like, well, obvious things like difficulties of accessing officials and official records. It is secretive, of course. You know, archives aren't opened unless there's much time elapsed. Uh, then you have problems of interpretation, problems of verification, and also researchers cite, well, there are perceived political obstacles as well. Maybe someone wouldn't like it if I research this, and well, you know, maybe they feel unpatriotic as well, or whatever. Anyway, from what I can tell, from what research exists, there are three main barriers to civil society actually being able to hold the intelligence elites to account in public. Uh, one is secrecy. I don't need to say much about secrecy. Anyone who covers this area knows secrecy is secrecy. Governments maintain that this is needed for national security, so there's very little transparency on intelligence agencies across the world. Um, and where intelligence policies do come to light with exposures, like Snowden's leaks, for instance, of mass surveillance, then you know various silencing techniques do come into play. Um, Self-censorship comes into play. Um, more coercive techniques come into play, th threatening and harassing the non-compliant media workers, for instance, who might be leaking the work, uh, publishing the leaks, uh, harassing the whistleblower, depending on which country you're in. So secrecy is a big thing. But another big thing is um, manipulative information provision. You know, where at key moments, and research does show this, the intelligence elites will try to influence civil society organs, especially the press. Um, I mean, Paul's work looks at this quite a bit. You know, there's un unattributed briefings to selected journalists. Um, there's selective declassification of true stuff, but it's there to misdirect attention from more pro problematic areas that they really don't want you to look at. Um, there's using opinion leaders like politicians to actually promote, you know, their version of what the intelligence policy is. So this is the second big obstacle to civil society, act actually doing a good job of holding intelligence elites to public account. The third problem is it's because it's intelligence, and intelligence is inherently uncertain. You know, it comes out in dribs and drabs. You don't get the full picture ever, really. And then what does the evidence mean um, if you get bits of the picture? And who is providing that picture? Is it a sanitized official account? Is it unearthed by critical whistleblowing or investigations? You never know, really, I think, as a journalist. It's uncertain. Um, so how credible can it be? And in a position of uncertainty in an environment of uncertainty. This allows those who want to manipulate and who have the resources to manipulate a lot of leeway. So these are the three main factors um, that civil society faces as obstacles. So, I mean, this gives journalists a really hard uh, job to do, I think, when they're trying to cover the contemporary intelligence elite. Uh, academic research shows all sorts of obstacles faced by journalists in this, on this beat. I mean, how do you negotiate that balance between secrecy um, national security and the right to know. How do you find information? How do you verify it? Do you have the time and resources to even recognize when you're being manipulated, to recognize disinformation? Um, what about the audience? Do they, where's, what, what is their resource of knowledge here? Do they even care? <laughs> Are they interested in this story? And then what do you do about being surveyed? And increasingly journalists are surveyed. This of course compromises source anonymity and it may have chilling effects on journalism. So I don't want to take up any more time, really. I just want to say, though, these are really big challenges. And to address these challenges, I think we need a number of things. Um, I think we need best practice guidelines, first of all, to encourage critical reporting, investigative reporting in this very difficult area. And one of the things my book does is actually it tries to develop a benchmark of what public accountability might look like when covering intelligence elites. So if you're interested, you can have a look. There's also a website as well I can point you to. Um, send that to the, uh, White House and send them a Do you think he'd listen? 
<laughs> the other thing I think we need are um, journalists to be very secure that their attempts to hold power to account aren't chilled by state surveillance. Journalists need to be very sure about protecting their sources. Uh, so sources will keep coming forward with leaks and whistleblowing, and journalists can keep holding power to account. And if anyone's interested, me and Paul, together with the National Union of Journalists, which is a big trade union for journalists in Britain, have come up with a not very brief guide, unfortunately. <laughs> we tried to keep it brief, but I've counted it's 47 pages, if you print it out. Uh, we've got some copies at the front. Just about how journalists might um, protect their sources in, in, a data, um, in the data-rich world that we're in. Uh, there is a website as well that has a version of this online, but an abridged version, because we realized on producing it that actually there's lots of techniques in there that people who might want to influence journalists badly, hack them or whatever, could actually use to, to get back at the journalists. So we didn't put a public version out there, but we do have some printouts of the full public version if you want. If you're a National Union of Journalists member, you can go to their website and get the full version as well. So that's all I'll say. Over to uh, okay. who's next. Um, I'd like to introduce Alex Arden now. I, I prepared a PowerPoint. Um, I'll go through it with you. Okay, so um, I was debating about talking about what I learned when I um, wrote my PhD on the failure of intelligence operation that happened in New York, Europe, namely with the Mossad, or to talk to you about my research on the beheading video of Daesh, and I decided to do both. Um, so I'll try that. This is a picture from Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv that I took yesterday. Um, oh. So um, Israel Security Agency is really trying to communicate about its new law on intelligence and uh, counterterrorism that was validated in 2016. And this law came in some kind of an environment that was very tense, both in Europe and in the Middle East, namely with Daesh. Um, ISIL. So the way they define the law to the public is the purpose of this law is to prevent the establishment, existence, and activity of terrorist organization and to foil acts of terror. This is done in order to set out provision in the field of criminal and administrative law and grant special enforcement powers. Special enforcement powers is a very nice way to say uh, what it is all about. Um, it defines, redefined terrorism, it redefines the legal criteria of surveillance pre prison sentences, um, and basically it redefines also the work of journalists whilst covering uh, this event that are going on daily in, in, uh, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so we are really trying hard in Israel to find a way to cover this type of, uh, of event. Um, you may know that the only journalist school uh, closed a few years ago, about two years ago. So there is no way that you can study journalism if you want to, either in Israel or in Palestine. You can do a BA or MA in journalism, and this is where I teach. I teach at Hebrew in the international school, and I teach counterterrorism. Within the course of counterterrorism, of course, we have to define what is terrorism and how to communicate about both uh, intelligence operation and terrorism operation. Um, I'm also researching patterns of media coverage of failed operation, failed intelligence operation, um, and pattern of, uh, of uh, narrative that are spread inside the hostage video with my co-author, um, Andrew Barr. So, Teaching counterterrorism is quite a, a struggle, as you may guess. This is a quote that I really like from my student. Um, she tried to interview Gil Hoffman, who is the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. Um, and she asked, like, how do you manage relationship between the media and the secret of state? And Hoffman said, it's easy. They tell you what you can say, and they tell you what you can't. <laughs> so isn't it a problem with freedom of press? And then he said, I cannot even answer that question, right? So, this is where we stand. This is what we're trying to do. So my students are mostly exchange, uh, exchange program from Turkey, mostly China, uh, France, US, and also Jordan. I have graduated from political science, criminology, journalism, psychology, security studies. And this is mostly, it's a course um, that, you know, it's elective, and it's mostly to like develop ties, diplomatic ties with all these countries, as you may understand. Um, so it's a, both a you know, research-oriented course. Um, we like teach what the research um, has been doing so far 
from Israel and the Middle East, and we're dealing with the apartheid wall or security fence um, as a counter-terrorist measure. That's the, the narrative that we have and we teach in Israel. The Mavi Marmara flotilla experience with like the army counter-terrorism and like how it impacts the global coverage, the intifadas, of course, 9-11, Ben Laden Hans. These are the subjects that we, we deal with, and this is the subject that students um, learn in detail. They have intensive Arabic studies. Um, in some class, I'm touring in, in relevant sites, so we'll definitely go in the center of the, of the tension. And they, they have for them, for most of them, the first-hand experience on protracted conflict. So we have to deal with a psychological aspect of like getting close to that too. Um, Middle East, living in, Jeru in Jerusalem. And also I'm teaching a lot of, uh, of um, research on, you know, all aspects of counterterrorism, like target killing, drones, uh, digital surveillance, public opinion poll, link, linked to uh, media coverage. So that's for the content of the of the course. Um, it's usually a semester course, and we're trying. I'm trying <laughs> the best I can, right, to like give more information through the platform, um, so that students who want to really practice as journalists afterwards and report on intelligence or counterintelligence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict have tools to do so, especially about different laws that are um, active. The other research that I published in 2015 in the Media War and Conflict Journal was about um, researching media coverage of failure of uh, intelligence operation. So this is really a niche because, of course, we don't know about intelligence operation and for sure not about the one that failed. Um, so it's trying to um, figure out, you know, how media deal between the tension between breaking news, the right to know of the, of the audience and the national security and the rights to silence from intelligence uh, um, entities, namely the Mossad in this case. Um, so I'm aware of time. I'm just gonna scan through and of course I can send you, email you the paper. Um, so that, that story was five Mossad agents that were captured. That's quite something, doesn't really happen so often. Um, during um, a diplomatic tension between Switzerland and Israel about Holocaust assets. So you had, you know, the affair that lasted about eight years, and within this, af this affair of the Holocaust terrorist assets, there is five agents that are, um, that are captured. And my PhD was scanning through the information from the Associated Press and the Swiss Press Agency from 96 to 2005 on this subject, and then I noticed this drop here, um, and that became my obsession. <laughs> so I tried to figure out, this is to wake you up, <laughs> I tried to figure out like why there was silence and how it was orchestrate, orchestrated. Sorry. Um, so the results are quite important for, for journalistic work. First of all, um, there is a pattern of coverage that I managed to identify. Um, media were only quoting either anonymous, this is no news, but also other media. So it's kind of a meta information, like the fact that other media are saying X, Y, Z, that was enough to validate as a source of information. Um, and the other problem was the framing of the information um, because there was no explanation of what was going on and there was no explanation of a silence that lasted about 10 days before breaking out the first information. Um, media were mostly communicating about hypotheses and they're very creative about various hypotheses. This is also led to like misleading of like, um, all this started with a, with, a, with a leak from the Israeli intelligence in Israel about the Mossad agent being caught, and it led to um, the head of the Mossad, Dani Atom, to be fired, so it was quite a serious event. So I, I kind of calculated the source of information and how they evolved with time. So we have, you know, media anonymous or specific information, and as you can see, the more the time moved, the more the sources are split um, sorry, at the beginning they split in a third, and then at the end of the coverage, uh, it's mostly 44% that are anonymous. So on the contrary to regular event where time helps people to feel confident and like give information, here you have the opposite um, pattern. And the other aspect that I managed to show with my research is uh, what I call bottom-up framing. So we start with a crisis and observation, journalists build up a narrative, and then we move on to the framing, which are potential meaning of, of the information. And in case of intelligence failure, it's upside down. Like we start with offering hypothesis of meaning. What does it mean for, the, for everyone involved? So here I listed a few. So 
media were focusing on the diplomatic crisis. There is a gas mask offer between Switzerland and Israel. Um, there is a visit from the Swiss president that is uh, mentioned to be cancelled. Um, there is an attack on Swiss neutrality. There is a demand of apology. All these are like kind of interesting leading information that are spread by different sources to not address the bottom line problem, which is the capture of the five Mossad agent. And then we move uh, further in time uh, about the narrative, what it means for Iran, Israel, and Switzerland, who were involved in the story. And we end up with knowing who was the target of the, um, of the operation led by the Mossad um, and where and why it happened. So this is something that I think is important in my research that it can show you whenever um, you read news or like you have to produce news with giving meaning instead of giving facts, then you may be stuck with something that is linked with, uh, with intelligence manipulation somehow, if I may. Um, okay. How long do I have? Two, two minutes? Okay. So I move to, um, to Daesh. So my... My research with, um, on Daesh execution video started in 2015 after the attack of the Bataclan in France and French government were desperate for a researcher who could do content analysis. Um, and it, you know, they approached me and other researchers um, to like, provide with a genuine understanding of what the hell they want, right? So the way we did is that we access an intelligence database it's a very expensive database that, you know, you, I needed um, some kind of grants to, to pay for that. Um, it's a database that gather information from local um, source uh, of intelligence and um, it's back up with, I guess, CIA, I don't know in detail. These are the two papers that we published um, on the subject recently. Um, and basically, um, what we are facing is a media battle that's part of the, of the jihad, right? The most important aspect of jihad is to break the media siege. Um, that is basically the silence that is imposed on, on jihad as, a, as an ideology. So I'll skip to this. Okay, so why did the, the production of video intervene? Because it's, it's, um, it's a chronological development that Daesh put in, in, in action, which is like first expelling the enemy, establishing the Islamic State that was done in 2014, and then conquer the land of the Muslim. That's a phrasing to say conquer the land back uh, from the time of the, before the Crusade and fight the Kufar, Kufar being someone who is an heretic more or less. So here, um, Daesh needed to communicate their political agenda to various audiences and recruit, and we know it has been extremely successful. How did they do? This is what we found out, that they used three um, press agencies that they installed. The name are listed below. Um, and basically, analyzing the video, this is the most graphic thing you will see, I will show you. Um, it's like s extracting semantic meaning from you know the image and, and the meaning. So, Again, I'll spare you the details, but we were quite struck by the fact that it was mostly the 62 video, which is seven hours footage that we analyzed, were mostly produced by the province of Iraq and not from Syria. Um, most of the videos that were labeled by the press agency had a uh, microphone, but the rest, it was not something that was systematic. So the technology of the production of the video is not very highly ranked. And 45 video out of 62 were in Arabic without subtitle. And that was quite surprising for French government and European counterintelligence research because they were expecting to have more like Europeans or like videos that were um, in Arabic. About This is about the display of the beheading. Um, and um, um, okay. So the rhetorical device that are used is mixing political and religious uh, uh, framing package that we identified. Um, the most important for us is to understand that Daesh has a very specific uh, categorization of audience and recruits and potential. Um, so insider and outsider, this is a very complicated uh, aspect, so maybe I'll not go in detail right now. But like at the end of the day, they're like copy pasting key concept like Westerners, Crusaders, Jew, and Christian as key categories that they copy based on Muslim um, population to like um, take, you know, take them out of this, uh, of this caliphate. So what I want to, to tell you about all these two aspects of the Mossad and Daesh is really 
um, that Daesh had a huge impact on redefining terrorism and therefore counterterrorism and therefore intelligence um, gathering. Um, and um, the, the problem with uh, Daesh um, communication is that they're mixing in their narrative both history, religion, and politics. And this is something that us Westerners have a lot of problem to deal with because we don't know how to communicate to various audience anything that is a mixture of politic and you know, eschat eschatological, religious take on, on the world. And that can make the, the work of the journalist extremely um, difficult. But what we figured out is that Jihad used the media to spread their message. And in each video, it does a double um, goal. It helps to recruit and spread the ideology. Um, and therefore, whenever you report about these videos, you're like stuck with meaning that maybe you don't want to spread and you don't know how to communicate about the videos without communicating about the content and helping the propaganda. So that's a challenge that we're facing. Thank you. a good uh, a couple of examples of how hard it is to co cover national security and terrorism. Uh, the next panelist I'd like to choose, introduce is uh, Josh Mayer, who uh, has uh, worked both as a reporter and as an academic. So, uh, Josh, uh, can you give us the US perspective on this? Sure, well, I can try. Uh, my first question, though, is Alexandra, is um, can I get access to that database, the one with the CIA uh, information you can. editor? Really? It, it costs. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, um, you need to be rich. <laughs> I would assume you need a security clearance, but that, that raises a question I wanted to ask you before I start mine, which is because of your important research, do you get um, uh, some sort of buy in from the Israeli government in terms of um, giving you access to information that, you know, that somebody walking in off the street wouldn't? I mean, do they, because you're sort of a vetted person who's an academic, are you able to get? Um, you know, interviews with people and access to data, failed intelligence operations and after action reports that other people aren't. Um, I'm just um, wondering, yeah. it's different. So, yeah. um, it's the French government mostly paying for that access. Yeah. Um, um, I applied for mm -hmm. Israeli input. I'll, I'll see in a few months. Yeah. Um, well, so I just mean in, in all of yeah. the, the, yeah. the, the. It's the mostly research. France. Yeah. yeah. So, um, luckily in the United States, it hasn't been a very busy time for national security reporters in the last few years. Um, we're sort of waiting for some stuff to happen. Um, I guess, uh, bad joke. But, um, you know, one of the things that you were talking about was um, the intelligence elites. And uh, a term that's been thrown around a lot in the United States is the deep state. So I'm not sure, I think there's a difference. But, um, you know, the deep state has been thrown around by the Trump administration as something really bad. Um, you know, that they're out to get us. But um, people that have been covering this stuff for a long time, um, I've been covering this stuff since the mid-1990s. Um, and actually, I have one of my former star students here who is now a journalist, uh, Abby Sewell. Um, but, you know, those of us who've covered it for a long time know that the deep state has actually served as a very important purpose. Um, um, if it is not uh, kept under control or with public oversight and, and congressional oversight, there can be a lot of problems. But essentially what it does is provides continuity um, by um, career people in the intelligence services um, uh, who make connections not only with people in Congress and other uh, stakeholders, but, but very importantly with other governments. So there's been a lot of governments who have had some very rocky times over the, over the, over the decades, Pakistan, India, uh, Egypt, uh, a lot of these countries where, uh, believe it or not, the, the contact military to military contract has actually helped stabilize these things if they get some crazy authoritarian government coming in. Um, sometimes the military people become the crazy authoritarian governments, but, but one thing that they do is they send a lot of foreign military people to Fort Leavenworth and other places in the United States and they go to officer school for about a year and that builds up uh, connections, I think, between people. A lot of the, the heads of the ISI and the Pakistan Army, for instance, went to Leavenworth. And, and in times of crisis, that has allowed people in the government here uh, to reach out to them and say, you know, don't um, sh throw that nuke at, at, you know, the country next to you or something like that. So, um, so I think that there, that's one thing that's interesting is the deep state. Um, it's true that national security reporting is one of the most important and difficult beats in journalism. Um, uh, you know, in Washington, um, I, I've been in Washington uh, on and off since, again, since the mid-90s, but I've been there permanently since um, a few days after 9-11. Um, and 
I can say that right now is the craziest time we've ever had. I think people will look back on this um, and, and, and judge the media um, in different ways. I think in some ways they'll judge it harsh, harshly. Um, uh, I think there was, there was one reporter that I know of in Washington that wrote a critical story of FBI Director Mueller uh, right after he was tapped to head the special counsel's office, um, and that was me. Um, and uh, nobody even, um, uh, I didn't even, I don't think I even got any Twitter, you know, retweets or, or things like that. I mean, it was, it was like I was not just the skunk at the picnic, but I was um, almost like a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a atomic skunk at the picnic. But I think that there has been in Washington developed over the years kind of a, um, um, synergistic relationship between the media and and the, the national security apparatus where people are, with some very notable exceptions, afraid to really uh, try to pierce the veil and write very critical stories. Um, some of the, there, you know, again, there's very notable exceptions. One of the most important things is when you have a paper as big as the New York Times and the Washington Post, um, they have beat reporters who cover the beat and they're sort of like the good cop, but they also have the bandwidth to have people come in uh, and be, you know, write critical stories because, you know, you know, when I was a Politico, for instance, I wrote three very, very uh, critical stories of, of the Obama administration and, and how they and the Trump administration had allowed politics to intervene in very, very important international law enforcement investigations. The first one was into Iranian nuclear traffickers uh, and the Obama administration um, basically really spun that and undermined, intentionally undermined some investigations, threw them out, let people out of prison uh, because of the Iran deal. And then after that happened, I got an email from somebody saying, hey, the same thing happened to us. And I looked into that and it turned out that the same thing to a less of a intentional degree had happened with a lot of very, very lengthy and serious investigations into Hezbollah, the, um, depending on what you where you live and what you believe is a terrorist group, uh, an important um, a political organization, a very important social and welfare service provider, or all of the above. Uh, but my story was about how they had also become uh, one of the world's biggest uh, criminal enterprises. They were trafficking in cocaine from Latin America, uh, weapons and all sorts of things, including chemical uh, weapons into Syria, um, A, to, to finance their operations, but also to help Iran geopolitically in Syria. Uh, they helped Venezuela become a narco state um, as a way to establish um, de uh, strategic depth in Latin America. Um, and those stories got crickets. I mean, no, there was no, nobody followed them, uh, except recently the New York Times followed the Hezbollah one a bit. But so it, it really doesn't necessarily help to, um, to go that far against the grain. And then, um, you know, the good cop, bad cop thing, if you are the same reporter doing those stories, and let's say your editor then says, I need you to break a bunch of stories on Trump, Russia. Um, well, guess what? They're, it's, it's hard because you've already um, pissed off, if I can use that term, the people that you're writing about. So a lot of the leaks that people are getting, uh, some of them are very good reporters, they're friends of mine, but they're leaks because people are leaking to them because they look at them as a friendly party. They're looking at them totally hypothetically, the New York, um, Guardian or something like that, or the, I mean, th there are people that are getting leaks because one side wants to get something out. Um, the FBI is known to leak a lot, uh, CIA leaks too. Um, but that doesn't give you the whole story. As you were saying, um, you know, one of the most important things about, um, uh, um, you know, being held, able to hold intelligence elites to account um, is making sure that the manipulation of intelligence is something that you can see through, and, and whether the information sanitized or, or over, overly critical, we're seeing that now with the Trump, um, basic, you know, the Trump's politically appointed attorney general. I don't know how much, how, how many people um, are following the. Oh, I was going to ask you to yeah. finish the sentence. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there, the attorney general is given a four-page distillation of, of the 400-page Mueller report, and nobody that I've talked to says that it's anything remotely like what's in the report. So, I mean, it's it's basically propaganda coming from the White House. But I, I just think it would be really useful if you could, because yeah. you, you taught at Medal yeah. for four or five years, yeah, well, yeah. And, and you were teaching students. Yeah. Well, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Because that's, that's sort of, I mean, yeah. you know, how, how, what kind of reaction do you think has had an impact on those students who then went, well, Right. To do their work. Well, I mean, yeah, I was going to just get to that. Um, how much? 
ideas. We, we're getting, we're beginning to run okay. low on time. And I think hopefully we'll get good questions. So I, I talk to students the same way I talk to people at, at you know investigative reporter conferences and all that. What I tell them is basically, um, I always tell them uh, to listen to B.B. King, you know, the blues guitarist who says, if your mother says she loves you, ch check it out. I mean, always be uh, questioning all of your sources, try to triangulate your information. Um, what I teach them is that you, you need to stick with this. You can't build sources in, in national security arenas, whether it's law enforcement, intelligence, um, without basically cultivating sources. That's the only way you're really going to figure this stuff out. And it takes a long time. And you, you have to wait till Pete, you know, find out who's retiring and talk to them, um, learn how to, you know, get access to the, you know, the um, associations of retired officers. I've had some of my, uh, I got a tip of, probably the best tip I've ever gotten, um, came from going to an FBI retirement dinner. Um, and afterwards, we all went, to, going to bars, of course, is the most important thing, because that's where they talk <laughs> and parties. But, you know, somebody told me that they would identified the, the, what they believe was the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. I wrote it down on a co cocktail napkin and, um, you know, but, but, but then you have to triangulate that information. So that's one thing that I tell students is you really have to stick do, with it. Do you um, tell them the, fame, the, the phrase that we use a lot is, which, why are the lying bastards lying to me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's if somebody is coming to you with information, you have to say, you know, uh, in fact, one thing that I do with the students is I tell them to figure out a way to nicely say, why are you telling me this? Because, you know, you, know, they can, you can easily offend people um, even though they shouldn't be offended, because they can basically be nakedly coming to you um, with information, trying to spin things. But if you say, you know, are you trying to spin this, then they'll be like, oh, I'm shocked, you know. I, but So you try to find a way to do that. Um, in D.C., we call it room service, you know, like a lot of times some of the big papers, and I was at the L.A. Times. We didn't get that many, but the New York Times and the Post did. Room service is when basically somebody just uh, by phone or drop something off, gives them a big scoop. You know, they don't have to do anything for it. And whenever that happens, you have to really, really wonder why are they doing that. And so, you know, um, George Orwell was a reporter uh, before he was a famous, um, you know, uh, writer, fiction writer. And uh, what he said is there's no such thing as objectivity. You have to know what your biases are and, and work against them to achieve a sense of fairness and balance. And the same thing goes, I think, with, with sources. If, you know, that doesn't mean false balance, you know, that, you know, some say Hitler killed six million people, uh, others, like the Nazis, say he didn't. I mean, there's, there's a line there. I don't believe in false balance, but I do believe in forcing yourself to sort of look and see how you can find the other sides to a story. You know, there's often five or six sides to a story, not two. So that's one of the things I, I tell students. Um, the last thing I was going to say is there was a story, uh, there was a panel here yesterday, I think, on how to, can you teach investigative reporting? Did anybody go to that? Yeah. I mean, it was good, but, you know, I think one of the things somebody said was, you can't teach anybody investigative reporting. I disagree. You might not be able to teach them to be a good investigative reporter, but you can teach them. But but somebody else said, you can, you can teach them what to look for and ha what to elevate within themselves, a natural sense of curiosity um, that, that does help them. After a while, if you've spent too much time doing this, you start not trusting anything. My wife is a feature writer, she's a journalist too, and we literally will look at the same thing. And she actually, it, it really bothers her sometimes because I'll, I'll be like, uh, I wonder what that person's up to. And she'll say, oh, I think they're just trying to help. And you know, you become naturally skeptical of almost everything, which, I mean, helps, helps keep you out of trouble as a journalist, but I may not Thank make you. you as much of a, a cuddly person. It's, it's funny you should raise the question of um, uh, song titles. My favorite one at the moment is I'm, I'm working on a paper called It's All Right Now mm -hmm. after the 1970 hit because one of the things you find when you're dealing with intelligence uh, um, and as many other areas of officialdom is that uh, you go and talk to them and they tell you something isn't happening. Right. Then many years later, for instance, rendition and torture, yeah. you discover it is happening, it was happening. Mm -hmm. by, by which time, 13, 14 years on, when the fine, you get the admission, Mm -hmm. They say, oh, it doesn't matter, though. It's all right now. Yeah. So everywhere you go, yeah. it's always all right now. Yeah. And then, lo and behold, a few years later, it all happens again. So, yeah. uh, so I'm trying to, I'm, I'm working this through as a sort of paper idea. To yeah. Say, and, I, I, and it's good if you can get yeah. I mean, 70s what, titles. Right, thing, bad it? company, right? So the yeah. one thing I would add to that is, and this is, hopefully students um, realize the importance. I mean, when I was at Politico, a lot of the reporters that were actually younger than my students, 
and I was supposed to be also helping mentor people there. And they didn't even, I don't think they even knew what Nexus was. Nobody bothered to get a Nexus account. I mean, the first thing I do when I do a story, I mean, if I have an hour to write it or something, I'm not gonna do this, but, but they don't know the background or the context or the history. When I go into an interview with somebody, if it's an important interview, I already know the answers to most of my questions. But I, I mean, one thing I loved about working at a big media organization is I could print 400 pages of stuff and bring it home. And, and I'm sorry, environment, but that's what I need to do. And I would just basically find out everything people have written about Hezbollah's drug trafficking, you know, you know, everywhere, like in a, in trade publications, everything else. So that way I would know what to do in the reporting. And I think that a lot of the younger journalists today um, don't do that. And I think, you know, maybe you don't need to do all of it, depending on the story, but I think that's something that you really need to, to, do, to do more of, is to understand the context and the history, so. I think what I'd like to do now is yeah. to open up to the uh, small and select audience that we have, uh, see if they've got any questions that uh, any of us can help with. So, could you say who you are, by the way, just, could you say who you are? No comment. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you described the, you described the deep state in a way that seemed to justify um, Trump's paranoia about it. So can you just clarify yeah. what you mean by the deep state and mm -hmm. what is real about it and what isn't no, as, you, yeah. as you do your important national security? Yeah, no, I mean, and that's true, and I, it's, thanks for asking that. Um, um, Yes, I mean, there, there's a lot of pitfalls to having a deep state. What, what I'm saying is that the, the reason, I mean, one of the ways it was, cr reasons it was created, I think, or, the, or the, the, the term was to establish these longstanding relationships, military to military. Um, I think those can be very easily abused. Um, the one thing that I, I think that Trump is, is um, uh, really misreading is that they're out to get him and that they always have been from the very beginning. I mean, I think that they're, they're very protective um, of the intelligence apparatus for good or for ill. Um, and it's not necessarily him. But one thing that there was a good story um, in Washington that a lot of people wrote, which was that when um, you know the new FBI, uh, sorry, the new CIA director um, was was her name was you know being put forth. She was accused of being part of the torture program and all of that. Um, but a lot of the old spooks, so this, Haskell, yeah. yeah. So a lot of the old spooks uh, and spies were literally coming out of the woodwork, and, and they were contact. They were, you know, the, you know, people from the agency would call you and say, "Hey, do you want to talk to, you know, Mary Margaret Graham, who n literally had never spoken before after she retired, and Frank Ar Ar Archibald and people like that." And the reason they were doing that is because they felt that they were trying to keep politics out of the agency. And, and I've written a lot of critic, I wrote a book that was extremely critical of the CIA for losing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the 9-11 mastermind before the attacks. So I'm not defending them, but I think what they were trying to do there was just make sure that there was somebody running the CIA that was at least somebody who understood from a career perspective what they were, you know, what, what was going on instead of getting some, you know, political, you know, um, Yahoo to do it. So instead they get a career Yahoo and a torture or stuff like that. So, so which I don't approve. When you, when you say the deep state, are, is this just an updated oh, phrase for what we, we used to call the national security state? Are yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we, it's we, a, the national the security bureaucracy. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I, I use a value, it's a value neutral and there's a lot of good and bad things about it, but it's just, yeah, the, the, the continuity of government in, of uh, intelligence. Yeah. Perhaps I could just ask Vian uh, if you'd like to define the difference between the deep state and um, intelligence elites. Yes, I've got two questions in my book <laughs> on page 14. I mean, because I wonder whether or not to use that term, mm -hmm. deep state, rather than intelligence elites. In, when I was, you know, what, what, what do you call these people? You know, uh, the intelligence agencies and the political and the corporate and the military interlocking relationships, what do you call them? Deep state already existed as a term, so I had a look at the literature on that. Um, and it, it basically means, you know, it, it's an entity operating in ways autonomous of the executive, that's basically what it means, or secretly shaping the executive, the, tr the Trump administration, for instance. Yeah. So, you know, Lindsay, Lofgren, the, these are some key writers on them. 
Um, now, the, these various people, they, some of, they, they disagree on the origins, for instance, of the deep state. Where does it come from? So um, Lofgren, who is a former congressional analyst, he mm. argues that the deep state arose from a gradual accumulation. It's just historical circumstance. It's not a conspiracy by some sort of secret cabal. On the other hand, somebody else, Lindsay, who's an anarchist political philosopher, he writes about the deep state. Um, he sees it as different from the shallow state. The shallow state are those very visible institutions that interact with citizens. Um, so Lindsay sees the deep state, um, he sees it as a post-war ideological term. Uh, it's something that allows contemporary states that are invested in neoliberal capitalism and beholden to neoliberal capitalism to actually hide their ability to act against the global market forces um, despite wielding unprecedented instruments of coercion and surveillance, as he puts it. And he says concealing the deep state actually absolves the shallow, visible state from actually acting on democratic or populist demands to address the economic and social ills arising from the seemingly inevitable and autonomous um, yeah. market-imposed limitations. And, and I don't want to get too hung up with this because I know so, we have a lot of other no, stuff. I but, but I think that it... it there's so many different meanings that it, mm. it, it can mean a lot of things to different people. One of the good meanings is that it's a state within a state. That's yeah, probably that's, that's uh, the, shorthand, yeah. the best way to describe it. I, 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 mean, that's right. I think the important thing is that uh, as academics, we have to define our well, terms. Uh, otherwise, it all becomes rather well, vague. I, re I really I wanted to use deep state. I didn't in the end because to me, it seems to assume that the executive is actually usurped. It's, it's an assumption within the term. You mm. know, It exists and the executive doesn't have any power anymore. I wasn't sure if that was the case with, with um, the intelligence elite case studies I was looking at, because the political executives seemed very invested and involved in some things, like the CIA, you know, covert operations and all that sort of stuff. So I, I, I just went for intelligence elites because I thought, look, it doesn't assume that the executive has usurped. It doesn't rule it out either. It may well be in certain cases, but it just doesn't assume it, and the literature seems to assume it. In some, you know, my, so. okay. my take would be that it's, we a take it's a check on the state. Yeah. Right. Okay. Did, uh, if the, if all I can say is if the deep state are, is after Trump, they're taking their time about it. Yeah. Um, I, I guess a question, here's a question for Paul and Vian. Um, I'm Diane Kemp, I'm from Birmingham City University, uh, but I'm also on the Broadcast Journalism Training Council, Deputy Chair. Uh, I suppose I'm wondering really, bearing in mind the kind of conversation and the, the, the emphasis on investigative journalism that's been throughout the festival this year, how much of this should be part of now what we teach I mean, we teach public affairs. Is it part of that? I mean, clearly, it could only be a small amount because otherwise you're going to have to drop something off the end. But have we come to a point where we should be teaching something around intelligence, understanding relationships? I have, I have a sort of view on this because, um, I, you know, I think the danger of investigative journalism is it gets slightly ghettoized and as though it is a particular set of small number of people who do something. And actually, uh, since I arrived at City, because we have a very well-known investigative course. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to do is remember we've got uh, nearly 500 other students and that they need to know about investigative journalism. And I see, so I, I try to see it in a broader frame and also one of the things I think that it, it just so happens that investigative journalists tend to be the people who do um, national security reporting at some point, I did myself, because it does need a set of those skills because you've got to be able to handle sources because you won't, you won't get at it otherwise. So, um, I, you know, I think it can be, um, if, if you want to do that, uh, you, you need to bring it into investigative journalism as an aspect of that is a good way of doing it. Unless you're specifically training people to, uh, you know, as, you know, if they're going to go into political journalism or, or Whitehall, they're going to cover. It's quite, it's quite a, but it, it needs to be out there. It's one of those things that you've got to, it's, it's such an important thing in terms of, You've, you've got to have students who have that critical faculty that when, and it's a terribly attractive. I mean, you know, if you get, the first time I met an MI5, officially met an MI5 person who was, they, they have a sense of humor. So they, I met them in, in, a, in a restaurant called KG, they, they had organized it, KGBs. So, you know, they do have a sense of humor. They're quite attractive people. They do interesting things. So it's, it, you know, and it's, it's interesting to me as an experienced journalist, and you've got to sort of say, Actually, you have to be really careful and think through this in a kind of logical, strategic way as to what's going on here and what are you being told and why are you being told it. Is that yes or no? It's yes or no. Uh, it's a yes from me. <laughs> uh, 
uh, uh, how you would fit it in with an accredited course, uh, which is BJTC, NCTJ, given the amount that's already there, I'm not quite sure. Uh, question here? Sorry, we haven't got time. Oh, we, right. Uh, well, I'd better bring proceedings to an end then. Th thank you very much for attending. Thank you to my panellists, Josh, Alexandra and Vian. And uh, uh, we will answer any questions probably outside. So. I've never had such a nice, uh, I've never played underneath the uh, harp playing <laughs> before. So, or never spoke. Encourage us to be more eloquent. No, 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 it's not your fault.